This is Chris Wade with the South Carolina Public Safety Chaplains Association. Today we're getting to know some of the chaplains in our state and we're here with Chaplain Kelly Mason. Kelly, um, what public safety agency do you work with and how long have you been there? Um, Chris, I've been at Lexington County Sheriff's Office for five years. I have been a prison chaplain there, and then I joined the Lexington Police Department as a police chaplain about a year ago. So I'm on okay. both sides, which is nice. Okay, so what do you like about being a chaplain there? They're drastically different. Um, I love the prison chaplaincy side because it's an opportunity to go speak with women. Mm -hmm. and remind them that just because they screwed up or made a mistake that their life isn't over. It's like, don't sit there and become a victim to your circumstances. Like, it's okay. You screwed up. Here's our plan. This is what we're going to do. Deal with your consequences. And then you're going to come out and we're going to start over. So there's a lot of people that feel their damaged goods. And I think sometimes they need somebody to just come in there and shake them a little bit and look them in the eye and remind them that God already knew they were going to do this. It's okay. There's something better for them. Um, I think a lot of them feel real, almost like mold, <laughs> something that's toxic and that they're not going to have a chance, that they've already ruined the chance they have. So I'm just going to keep doing everything bad. And it's good to go in there and remind them who they belong to. Um, and then on the police side, a lot of the officers, especially men, uh, have been taught don't cry, don't talk, uh, don't discuss your feelings, and they do go through a lot of PTSD. Sometimes with women chaplains, they do share their feelings more. It's not always, but um, it is an opportunity to make friends and spend time with them, and when they're ready, they'll decide to share something if they want. So it's an opportunity to share the gospel with polar opposites, and I, I like that. Okay. So what was your faith tradition growing up? <laughs> so growing up, I, my dad was Greek uh, or Armenian Orthodox, which is Mediterranean, and my mom was nothing. So I was raised with nothing. Um, be a good person, don't lie, cheat, steal, murder, and you'll be fine. Um, my mom taught me that somebody rolled the rock away and stole Jesus's body. Um, they were not a fan of Christians. They felt it was an organized business and I was kind of warned to stay away from anything dealing in Christianity. So we didn't have church on Sunday. I don't think I realized I was different until maybe middle school when I couldn't spend the night at someone's house, you know, and it was like, mom, why don't we go to church on Sunday? Oh no, we don't do that. We don't do that. So I wasn't raised with the faith. And I think okay. that's when the most of the people in my life that know me would, this is, it would be hilarious if they knew that I was a chaplain. Yeah. Because <laughs> that was not how I was raised. Well, when, when did it all change for you? Um, I want to say in college, I told my dad I was getting curious about faith, that I felt like there was like an empty spot and I couldn't figure out what it was. And he said, well, don't pick one. If you, wanna, if you want to look into one, you need to look into all of them. So in college, I took all the classes. I took everything from Jainism to Islam and Christianity and everything. And I don't think until my father had passed away that I really start pursuing it. So late 20s. So it's a long time. Okay. Um, so tell us about your family. You told us a little bit, but tell us about your family. Um, my immediate family, I have a 16 year old who is graduating high school next year. It is just the two of us. Um, I have a mother who and father that are split between Michigan and Florida. And I have some aunts and uncles sprinkled throughout different states, but it's really my son and I, that's our family. So it's been the three of us, meaning God, my son and I for as long as we can remember, really, since 2005, I think. Okay. Um, and then we so, have, I can't leave out, hold on, I can't leave out, I have nine other kids, but they're goats, and I have six chickens and three dogs. <laughs> we cannot leave that out. <laughs> okay, touche, touche. <laughs> oh, so yeah. what other 
um, ministries are you involved with? Um, I'm an area coordinator here in Columbia for um, Operation Christmas Child. And so I work with all the schools, middle schools, elementary schools, private schools, high schools, and we help get all the boxes prepared. We go into schools and do presentations and share about Samaritan's Purse. That, that keeps me very, very busy. Um, and that's really it. That's enough. <laughs> that is um, enough. When I have time, obviously I'm with Scopisca, so I spend a lot of time with Scopisca also. Um, and I think we're just focused, as you know, Chris, trying to grow it and really make sure that we catch all the other departments and bring them in and that we don't lose one more officer this year. So mm -hmm. um, we've got a good team, I think, don't you? So, so what got you into chaplaincy? <sighs> mm. It wasn't planned. Um, I can tell you that. I had been chasing investigation since I was young and I had applied to the FBI when I was 24. I went and got certified as a paralegal and they called me a couple of days before I was about to get married and my dad was really sick. And it was one of those options like Fargo, North Dakota, you know, it was somewhere in the middle of nowhere. Um, I worked with Columbia College out of South Carolina for three years. Um, we grew their criminal justice department. So it was our job actually to go and meet every chief, every sheriff, go to all the conferences. Um, we had to get up and share about gaining your bachelor's degree from all of your FTO hours and NIMS and all that other stuff. And I started having a lot of female officers after our presentations start asking if they could call me. Can I email you? I know you're a single parent. Can we talk? Um, I've gone through a lot. I think you, you would be good to talk to. And honestly, Chris, I've listened to, to it for a little bit, but I kind of blew it off. And the more I started blowing it off, the more I didn't sleep at night. And finally it was like, it kind of felt like you dummy, you're not supposed to be in law enforcement. You're supposed to be in law enforcement chaplaincy. And honestly, I really tried to deny it for a long time because I was still being stubborn about what I wanted and what I thought I had planned for my life. So no, chaplaincy wasn't really planned. But as time went on, doors would open in places that I didn't see, and it was starting to all kind of make sense. So I don't know. It just kind of happens, I guess. Yeah. Some people, I think it's planned. But for me, it was one of those things that, over a lot of time you just he's saying this is what you need to do and this is what you need to share after everything so mm -hmm. it's kind of where i've been placed i guess so do you have any kind of a background in public safety ch beyond chaplaincy i mean i did um i have been an active investigator since 2012. um i had to get certified in tactical firearms in the state of Ohio to be an investigator. And we had a contract with the public defender and I did mostly sex abuse cases, uh, homicide and gang work. Um, I slowly moved into insurance fraud and things like that. So I did that for, I don't know, I'm on my eighth year right now, but right now I mostly, if I have time, I'll take a case, but mostly for insurance fraud or um, taking a witness statement for an accident, maybe doing a property check or something like that. But I'm not involved as much as I used to be. Okay. Um, but it's good because the time that I was, it allows me, it allows me, they know that I can relate to what they've done, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's interesting how that worked out. Okay, cool. So what do you love about being a chaplain? You're that, the people that are in jail you know, like in their eyes, like you can just see it. You might as well just put bars over the eyelids, you know, right here. And there's little hands that are coming out kind of, um, it's just sharing hope. It's sharing what God has done in my life and continuing to tell people that it's not a joke. It's not fake. It's not a book of stories. And, um, when people hear you talk about it, it's different than, oh, you're Christian. 
it's different. When you talk about it, people can feel that it's really had an impact in your life and you can only hope that somebody else would experience that same thing. No, it's, it's really hope for a lot of people that don't have it and sharing your testimony of what has happened. Yeah. Very true. Encouraging a relationship that they don't have, reminding them it's not church on Sunday. Mm -hmm. It's daily. Cause everybody's like, I used to go to church. I'm like, it's not about church. It's not about going to church on Sunday. It's, you know, it's a relationship. It's literally talking to him all day, doing laundry in the car, going to get groceries. When you're stressed out, you don't know if you can pay your bills and how you're going to make ends meet. It's a, it's a constant daily talk. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people who are more old school don't know about that. Yeah. So what are some of the challenges you see about being a chaplain? Oh gosh. The number one thing, I don't like people knowing. I almost don't, I don't like being introduced that way sometimes. And I don't like people knowing because it changes their behavior. Uh, especially law enforcement officers. They're like, oh, I'm sorry I cussed, you know. Uh, or <laughs> you have to remind them you're no different than yeah. they are. You know, you've just devoted mm -hmm. your life to sharing the gospel. But once you tell people, it does change some of their opinions. That's number one. And number two, um, people automatically categorize you. You don't have an opportunity to be um, a person that they meet and a friend that they know. You're automatically a holy roller. You automatically can't speak for yourself. You can only quote scripture. Um, I feel like you sometimes lose the opportunity to have a friendship or get to know somebody because they've already put you in a box. Of, you do know, you, don't talk to me. Yeah. Do you think that that's a problem here in the Bible Belt or what? No, I think it's everywhere. I think it's easier in the Bible Belt. I think it's harder more out west. Um, cities smaller towns are pretty good but i think once you get into that larger city and you have a melting pot of all faiths um i think it's prevalent everywhere mm -hmm. and now that we have all these acceptances of you know lifestyles and things i think it makes it harder i think people just want to live they want to live and take you know it's like m, &M gospel where they just take a few M&Ms, they take like a few little things of the, the gospel they like, and then they put theirs in there to replace this and make this. And so I think it's, I think it's a tough day and age to be a, a chaplain, actually, I do. So if you were asked by someone who felt they were called to get into chaplain ministry, how would you direct them? Uh... I will have to say, first and foremost, when I was not a Christian, I hated when people would say, I'll pray for you. I hated that. Or I hated when people would say, pray about it, Kelly, just pray about it. No, I don't want to pray about it. You know, I don't, that's not how I process. You know, I have to know the pros and cons and I have to know my education and is it a good decision and write it out, analyze it. But now that I'm on the other side, I know that prayer works. I know that he hears you. I know that he answers you. Um, and I don't think it's something, and I don't think it's a calling you take lightly. I have found that the chaplains that I have met have had a very long isolation period in their life, or they have had great tragedy. Um, I believe it's a calling. I don't, I don't feel like it's something where you just wake up and say, I'm gonna be a chaplain. I really don't. I think God has picked who he wants to be chaplains. I think he has been, I don't wanna say grooming, but has been allowing all that has happened in your life to reach a certain period where he's ready to share you with the world. And now he's ready to use you to help share his, his word, his book. So I would say pray about it. I would say talk to chaplains that are one year in and 20 years in. And I would do some self-evaluating and find out, um, for example, like, uh, what's the name of that? 
Strengths Finder, and you can take a, a test, and it really kind of analyzes your personality. Um, are you flexible? Can you can you not get mad? Can you you know relate to anybody? Talk to anybody? Are you adaptable? But it has to be a calling, in my opinion, or it's something you'll pick up and then just quit. And chaplaincy so, is based on relationship, so I don't think that's the best thing to do. So, what desires do you have for being a chaplain, and where do you want to go with your ministry? Right now, in 2020, today, I don't want another year to go by with our 46 counties and our sheriff's offices to not have a department. That is my number one focus right now. So we're working through Scapisca and all of this to really bring awareness to an actual group of chaplains that aren't in the wings, that aren't called when somebody passes away. To mm -hmm. me, that's not a chaplain's department. It's every day. It's calling the officers. It's being in touch with their spouses. It's helping them when they've seen something tragic. But the problem is, is a lot of departments that are real small don't know that maybe there's not funding included. What's it going to cost me? We don't really need one. We're a small town. I will call, you know, pastor so-and-so over at the church if someone dies. I don't think a lot of departments know the severity. And right now we're almost at 50 police officers in 2020 that have already committed suicide in four months. Yeah, and so right now it's an awareness. Yeah. Yeah. It's an awareness issue. And so my goal was to make sure before this year ends that the majority of departments, if they haven't started it, then they've connected with their neighbor police department or sheriff's office to have a chaplain who will spend some time with their officers and realize that they're not just there to report back to the chief or sheriff with gossip. You know, I think a lot of officers um, struggle sometimes with the idea of a chaplain. So you have to really be ready to spend time for the long haul and become friends with them so they can gain trust. But it's definitely suicide awareness. Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to thank you for spending time today, um, letting us get to know you and sure. your, your heart and your passion sure. and your calling. I mean, it's, I've known you now for a couple of years and you're a great friend mm -hmm. to work with um, and I definitely appreciate your heart towards chaplaincy so thank you thanks Chris I look forward to working and getting all this growing and bringing all this awareness and then I'm going to interview you <laughs> <laughs> okay sounds good <laughs> all right thanks so much